We're learning the name of a woman who was killed in a cold case. Her remains were found 45 years ago out east in Massachusetts. Well, today, the woman known as Gramby Girl actually has a name. She is Patricia Ann Tucker. Located in the scenic hills of western Massachusetts, the town of Granby is a captivating destination. With its serene downtown and idyllic countryside, Granby offers an ideal escape for anyone looking to unwind. And so our story begins in this enchanting corner of the world. On November 15, 1978, a group of children ventured at about 5 p.m. into the woods off Amherst Road in Granby, Massachusetts. As they frolicked through the colorful foliage, they stumbled upon a mysterious pile of leaves. Out of sheer curiosity, they decided to dig through it, not expecting what they'd find. To their shock and horror, they uncovered a human skeleton, significantly decomposed. The remains were dressed in blue jeans and a short-sleeved shirt adorned with a green swan. On the feet were a pair of shoes that only a young woman would wear. To make matters even more disturbing, the group noticed a brown leather belt wrapped around the neck of the skeleton. This startling discovery was just the beginning of a haunting mystery that would grip the town of Granby for years to come. As the shock of the gruesome discovery began to sink in, the children knew they had to alert the authorities. It didn't take long for detectives to descend upon the site. They cordoned off the area and, with meticulous attention to detail, they confirmed what the children had already guessed. The skeletal remains belonged to a woman. A glint soon caught their eyes, and upon closer inspection, they found a gold ring on one of the bony fingers. Was it a wedding ring? They had no idea. A closer look also revealed a shocking state of decay on the victim's front teeth. The brown leather belt found around the neck of the victim was also a mystery, but John M. Callahan, who was Northwestern District Attorney at the time, had his theory. He believed that the belt had been used to drag the woman's body through the woods from the road. The detectives then combed through the victim's clothing, hoping to uncover some clue about her identity. But to their dismay, there was nothing. No wallet, no ID. Soon after this, the body was carefully removed from the area. The cold hard truth was revealed during the autopsy of the skeletal remains. The cause of death was a single bullet wound to the temple, and the manner of death was clear, a homicide. As the medical examiner worked painstakingly on the bones, they estimated that the victim had been dead for months, likely since June 1978. Also by studying the bones, they could discern that the victim was between 19 and 28 years old. As news of the discovery spread, the small town of Granby was on edge. Everyone was asking the same questions, who was she, and who could have killed her? Detectives knew that uncovering the victim's identity was the first step in solving the case, but they were facing a daunting task, as they had very little to go on. They had no leads, no clues, and no identification. It was as if the victim had never existed. Despite their tireless efforts, they found no reports of missing persons that matched the woman's description. Determined not to give up, detectives meticulously examined every inch of the victim's clothing once again, hoping to find even the slightest hint of a tag or label that could give them a lead. But their efforts were fruitless. There was nothing to indicate where the clothing had come from. Frustrated, they decided to approach the case from a different angle. They began to study the area where the body was found and soon realized that it was close to five colleges, namely Mount Holyoke, Hampshire, Amherst, Smith College, and the University of Massachusetts. A spark of hope lit up within them as they speculated that the victim might have been a student at one of these colleges. Without wasting any time, they contacted each of the colleges and made inquiries about missing students. However, to their disappointment, the response was the same from all five colleges. There was no missing student reported. The detectives were back to square one. The detectives refused to give up, despite hitting a dead end. They had no choice but to think outside the box. 
they came up with a plan to compare dental x-rays from the victim with x-rays of known missing persons who fitted her general description. It was a long shot, but it was worth a try. However, it turned out to be a fruitless endeavor because after countless comparisons, the x-rays didn't match with any of the missing person's records. Weeks passed after this with no leads until a ray of hope shone through. A local motel operator contacted the detectives, stating that the description of the victim matched a woman who had checked in at their establishment in early 1978. Detectives felt a surge of excitement and quickly started investigating this new lead. However, their hopes were soon dashed when they found the woman alive and well. The disappointment was palpable. As days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, the identity of the deceased woman remained a mystery and the investigation by detectives slowed down significantly. With no name to call her own, the woman was given the moniker The Granby Girl after the town where she was found. She was laid to rest in the West Cemetery in Granby and a simple white cross bearing the words Unknown Girl marked her grave for years to come. In 1998, the community decided to come together and honor the Granby girl's memory. They never forgot the tragedy and the mystery surrounding it. They remained haunted by the fact that someone's daughter, sister, or friend had met such a brutal end. And despite not knowing her name, they wanted her to rest in peace, recognized and remembered. So, with hearts full of compassion, they pooled their resources and raised about $500 to replace the old weathered cross with a gravestone. The new stone bore the simple but solemn message, Unknown, November 15, 1978, In God's Care. Years went by after this, and the Granby girl's case remained unsolved, leading detectives feeling helpless. However, with the advent of DNA technology, Hope was reignited in the hearts of those determined to bring justice to the unidentified woman. In March 2022, Massachusetts State Police detectives, in collaboration with the State Police Crime Laboratory and the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, embarked on a new journey to solve the case. With great care and precision, the Granby girl's corpse was exhumed and a biological sample was sent to Othram, a renowned forensics lab in Texas, for further analysis. The Othram scientists dove into their work with zeal, determined to solve the decades-old mystery. They analyzed the Granby girl's DNA profile and, with the help of their expert genealogists, pieced together a family tree that gave detectives a new lead to follow. And then, after months of waiting and wondering, the breakthrough they'd been hoping for arrived. On January 23, 2023, Othram contacted the Massachusetts State Police detectives with the news they'd been waiting for. They had identified a woman in Maryland who was likely related to the murdered woman. The detectives felt a surge of excitement. At last, they were one step closer to finding out who the Granby girl was. Detectives wasted no time in contacting the woman who had a potential connection to the Granby girl. In the meeting with detectives, she disclosed that her missing aunt from the 1970s may have been the unidentified victim. Moreover, she revealed that her aunt had a son named Matthew Dale who lived in North Carolina. The detectives then made their way to meet with Matthew and informed him of the reason for their visit. Matthew, who had already registered his DNA in a database, quickly provided detectives with his digital DNA profile. It only took a few hours to make a comparison with the Granby girl's DNA and the result was a 100% parent-child match. It was a moment of pure elation for everyone involved. The Granby girl finally had a name, and her name was Patricia Ann Tucker. As detectives dug deeper into the life of Patricia Ann Tucker, they found that she'd been born on July 28, 1950. Her early life remains unknown. However, records show that she'd been married multiple times and had gone by different names, including Patricia Dale and Patricia Heckman. In 1977, she'd married her last husband, Gerald Coleman, in Middletown, Connecticut, and they'd bought a house in the peaceful town of East Hampton, about 20 miles southeast of Hartford. During her marriage to Coleman, her son Matthew, who was from a previous marriage, lived with them. Matthew had been only five years old when his mother died. 
The events leading to her death are unclear, but according to Matthew's recollection, on August 8, 1978, his mother, together with her husband, Coleman, dropped him off at the home of an acquaintance named Laura Holmes in Chicopee, promising to return soon. But she never did, and neither did Coleman. Two days later, Laura reported her disappearance to the Department of Children and Families, and Matthew's world was turned upside down. But fate had a way of bringing him back to his roots, and he was eventually reunited with his biological father who raised him. Yet the memory of his mother's sudden disappearance continued to haunt him until the day the detectives came knocking on his door. As the detectives delved deeper into Patricia's past, some details stood out like a glaring red flag. The first was that Matthew had believed that Laura had reported her mother missing, but when detectives searched through missing persons' databases, they found no trace of a report filed by Laura. It was a perplexing mystery that left them scratching their heads. Had Laura Holmes lied about reporting Tucker's disappearance? Or was there another explanation for the missing report? There was no way for them to know because Laura was deceased. The second detail that stood out was that Patricia's husband, Coleman, never reported her missing. The detectives knew they'd hit upon something significant and they started to consider the possibility that Coleman may have played a part in Patricia's ultimate demise. However, there was no way for them to question him. Coleman had long since passed away. In 1995, he'd been found guilty of heinous crimes, including sexual assault, indecent assault and battery, and assault with a deadly weapon. He died a year later in 1996 in the state prison where he'd been serving his sentence. On Monday, the 6th of March, 2023, a press conference to address Patricia's case was organized by the police. A short statement written by Matthew was shared by the authorities. In the statement, he expressed his gratitude to everyone involved in the search for his mother. He thanked the detectives for their unwavering commitment to the case and for never giving up on their efforts to identify his mother. At least I have some answers now after 44 years. It's a lot to process. But hopefully, the closure can begin now, Matthew had said in the statement. At the moment, detectives remain optimistic that, with time, more leads would emerge that could help them finally piece together the puzzle of what ultimately happened to Patricia. On the morning of May 24, 1985, a school teacher in Newton, Baker County, Georgia, set off on her daily commute. As she drove along Highway 91 near Colquitt Ford Road, she noticed something unusual by the roadside. At first she thought it was just a discarded pile of clothes, but as her car flew by, she realized it was a woman lying in a ditch. The teacher immediately stopped, turned around, and drove back to the scene. With a sense of urgency, the school teacher pulled over her vehicle and hurried to the woman's side. As she approached, she could see the young woman lying still on her back. Her blonde hair splayed out around her, and she appeared to be in her prime. The teacher took a closer look and noticed that the woman was wearing a faded pair of blue jeans, a gray t-shirt, and white tennis shoes. She also noticed bruises on her face and arm, but relief washed over her when she saw that the woman was breathing. She looked around and couldn't help but notice a white pillow that lay a few feet from where the injured woman was. The teacher's heart raced as she realized that this woman's life was in her hands. Time was running out, and every second counted if she wanted to save a life. She sprinted back to the road and frantically waved her arms at the first truck that appeared. When the driver climbed out, she explained the dire situation and led him to the scene where the unconscious woman was. Without wasting a second, the pickup driver raced off to get help while the teacher anxiously waited by the woman's side praying for her survival. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the flashing lights of police cars and an ambulance appeared on the horizon. The woman was carefully loaded into the ambulance and rushed to Phoebe Putney Hospital, where a team of dedicated doctors and nurses worked tirelessly to save her life. Though they were able to stabilize her condition, the woman remained unconscious, her fate uncertain. There were no visible signs of a physical or sexual assault However, the medical staff worried that she had suffered brain damage. The identity of the woman was also a mystery. As she lay in the hospital bed, hooked up to machines that beeped and whirred, 
Detectives scrambled to find any clues that could help them solve the case. But despite their best efforts, they came up empty-handed. There was no identification on her person that could give them a lead, and so she was classified as a Jane Doe, just another nameless victim in a sea of unknowns. But the question remained, how had she ended up in that ditch? Had she been thrown from a car, or had she stumbled and fallen on her own? The detectives couldn't be sure, and as they continued their investigation, they began to consider even more sinister possibilities. Could she have been the victim of a hit and run, left for dead on the side of the road? The uncertainty was maddening. The detectives could also not make heads or tails of the pillow that had been discovered near where the woman was found. Was it just a coincidence, or was it somehow connected to the mysterious circumstances surrounding her discovery? Desperate for leads, the authorities decided to make the case public. They captured the woman's image, taking a photo of her as she laid in the hospital bed. They didn't stop there. Determined to leave no stone unturned, they meticulously crafted several sketches of the woman, each one capturing a different aspect of her face. These sketches and the image were shared far and wide, with media outlets across the surrounding areas plastering them across their front pages. Detectives held out hope that the publicity would lead to someone coming forward with information about her. A few days after the woman was found, Hobson Irwin, who was the Baker County Sheriff at the time, received a phone call. The call came in from an unknown woman who claimed that the injured woman in the hospital could be her missing daughter. Excited at the prospect of finally identifying the woman, Irwin asked for a description of her daughter. However, when the woman on the phone mentioned that her daughter had black hair, Irwin's heart sank. It was evident that the injured woman in the hospital was not her daughter, as she had blonde hair. Detectives continued to hope that the injured woman would regain consciousness at some point and give them some clues about her identity, but sadly, that never happened. The first day of June in 1985 was a day that no one in the Phoebe Putney Hospital could forget. It was the day when the unidentified woman, who'd been fighting for her life for so long, finally succumbed to her injuries. The doctors and nurses did everything they could to save her, but her injuries were too severe, and her body just couldn't take it anymore. With the woman's death, the mystery of her identity even deepened. The autopsy that was conducted on her revealed that she died from subdural hematoma, which occurs when a blood vessel between the skull and the brain is damaged by blunt force trauma to the head. Stretch marks were also noted on the woman's abdomen, indicating that she may have given birth at some point in her life. The woman's fingerprints were also taken with the hopes that they would lead to her true identity. But despite detectives' exhaustive search through countless databases, their efforts proved futile. No match was found. The woman was soon laid to rest in the Newton City Cemetery with a simple headstone that bore no identity, but just her date of death. The community, touched by the tragedy of her death, took it upon themselves to care for her grave, hoping that one day her family would come and claim her. Detectives also shared the same sentiments, and so the case remained open. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation and Baker County Sheriff's Office continued to explore different avenues and search for clues that might finally unravel the mystery, but nothing came up for a long time, and eventually, the pace of the investigation slowed down. When Dana Mead became Baker County Sheriff in 2008, he felt a deep sense of responsibility to uncover the truth about the unidentified woman buried in the Newton City Cemetery. He was determined to bring closure to the case, not just for the community, but for the woman's family who might still be out there. Sheriff Mead wasted no time and reached out to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, hoping they could take another look at the case and explore any leads that might have been overlooked. He believed that there had to be something they could do to finally identify the woman and bring peace to her family. It wasn't until four years later, in 2012, the detectives decided to take a fresh approach to the case. They planned to use scientific techniques to finally uncover the truth. DNA testing was the first step, but they wanted to go further. Isotope analysis, a method that could determine where the woman grew up, was also on the table. 
In September of that year, the team exhumed her remains to collect samples for testing. A bone fragment was carefully packaged and sent off to the lab to perform the isotope analysis. A different sample was sent off for DNA testing, and the wait for answers began. As the results of the isotope analysis trickled in, the investigators hoped to finally catch a break in the case. However, they were disappointed as the analysis suggested that the unknown woman may have lived in as many as 12 different states, leaving them with no clear direction to pursue. In March 2013, detectives took another step forward. The DNA sample taken from the woman's remains was added to a database of missing people with the hopes of finding a match. However, despite several comparisons with missing persons, none of them matched the unknown woman. It was yet another dead end in a case that had already seen so many. The winds of hope blew once again in March 2022 as the Georgia Bureau of Investigation joined forces with the FBI to seek out the true identity of the woman. This time, they aimed to leave no stone unturned and sought the expertise of Othram, a renowned private DNA lab based in Texas. A portion of the remains from the 2012 exhumation was sent to the lab for testing. With the stakes so high, the scientists at Othram sprang into action with a sense of urgency and purpose determined to finally solve the long-standing mystery once and for all. For 10 long months, the scientists at Othram toiled tirelessly to build a comprehensive DNA profile for the unknown woman. And each day they spent analyzing her remains brought them closer to the truth. Finally, their efforts paid off and the DNA profile was complete. It was then passed on to the FBI for the next crucial step. And this was genealogical research. The genealogical research conducted by the FBI finally yielded a promising lead. They discovered a high probability that the unidentified woman was none other than Mary, who'd vanished without a trace back in May 1985. With this, everyone involved in the case was on edge as they waited to see if this was indeed the breakthrough they'd been praying for. Detectives quickly turned to her family for answers. Towards the end of January 2023, one of Mary's children was contacted and asked to provide DNA for verification. Although it was unclear which of her children stepped forward, the DNA comparison showed a parent-child relationship. That simple DNA test provided the confirmation they needed to solve this mystery once and for all. A look at Mary's background revealed that she was born on the 13th of December, 1956 in Gary, Lake County, Indiana, to parents Elizabeth Hammett and Davis Hammett. She was the only girl among five brothers in a household that was always bustling with energy. Though little is known about her early life, what is certain is that her family eventually made their way down to Florida. As Mary grew older, she fell in love and married a man named Peter Hall. They were blessed with two precious daughters, but unfortunately, their love story was not meant to be. For reasons unknown, they went their separate ways leaving Mary to navigate life as a single mother. Despite the heartache of divorce, Mary refused to give up on love. And it wasn't long before fate intervened and she met a man named Carl Cohen. They quickly fell in love and were married, eventually welcoming two sons into the world. Sadly, Mary's marriage with Carl also came to an end, leaving her to raise her four children on her own. Following this, Mary, with her children, moved to Seminole County, Florida, and began living there. As they settled into their new life, Mary made sure that her children had everything they needed to thrive. They laughed and played together as a family, creating memories that would last a lifetime. And despite the challenges she faced, Mary never lost her sense of fun and adventure. She was a free spirit always eager to try new things and experience all that life had to offer. But things took a dark turn when everyone least expected it. May 1985 was a month that would forever change the lives of Mary's children. It was a month filled with uncertainty, fear, and heartache. One day, Mary, who was then 28, left her home without any explanation and no one heard from her again. I was 10 years old, and she was fun, and she was silly, and then one day she was gone. Angelique Hall, Mary's eldest daughter, said to the media, 
Because I was 10 years old and she was fun and she was silly and um, then one day she was gone. We never heard from mom again, said Daniel Cohen, who was only seven when his mother disappeared. Mary was reported missing a few days after she disappeared. Rumors and theories were whispered in hushed tones, but the prevailing belief was that she'd simply walked out on her family. As time went on, Mary's children were forced to face the harsh reality that their mother was gone and wasn't coming back. They were left with a deep sense of loss and sadness, wondering why their mother had left them behind. It wasn't until detectives reached out to them decades later did they know what had happened to her. The news shook them to the core. After almost 40 years of uncertainty, they finally received an answer to the question that had haunted them. The revelation brought a mix of emotions ranging from shock, disbelief, relief, and even grief as they grappled with the knowledge that their mother was gone. I'd always hoped that she would, you know, come waltzing back into my life, Daniel, one of Mary's children, had said. I guess I'd always hoped that she would, you know, come waltzing back into my life. The revelation of Mary's identity may have brought some closure to her family, but it also opened up a new set of mysteries that left them troubled. Despite the advanced DNA analysis, there are still questions that remain unanswered. Why did Mary disappear? Did she leave by choice? Or was there something sinister at play?